best intro ever. All right, do it up. Hello, welcome to the Regeneration Podcast. I'm your co-host, Michael Martin, with my other co-host, Michael Sauter. How's it going, Mike? Going very good. Had a lovely breakfast this morning with um, people I met. We could say fan of the podcast, but I think I'd be putting the cart before the horse. It was about two years ago I met um, Kevin, whose bride, Marie, is uh, has a uh, uh, has a sister who's married to a guy who likes Michael Martin. And somehow that came out at a party where this guy wow, was now. Weird. I'm yeah. married to a guy who likes Michael Martin. Yeah, like his he he's married to no, he's married to he's been married to a girl whose sister's husband likes Michael Martin. Okay, and there you it go. came out at a party. It was really a delightful party. And then it got, right. I think there was familiarity with the podcast. Now a year and a half later, there's more familiarity with the podcast. But I met with a former like student. It, right? No, but I met with two wonderful couples, Kevin and Marie and Derek and Tina. And we talked about some pretty intense stuff today. Uh, right. Yeah, Derek has got to, we got to have these people on in different permutations and combinations. But Derek himself is a a PhD, very familiar with the Russian sophiology, okay. uh, University of Toronto, really interesting guy. I think much more of a radical than even he's aware, you know? Cool. Um, yeah, so that'll be great. And so how was your, how was your uh, morning? Uh, I'm still mourning the the passing of brother wayne kramer of the mc5 i don't know if you heard no tell me what's going on wayne kramer you know, nobody knows who that is unless you're from detroit then and you're a white boy from detroit then you totally know especially when you grew up in the 70s like i did you know who the mc5 was you know who ted nugent was you know who the ted nugent. Were, right alice cooper those that was our Absolutely, that was, yeah that was the detroit sound right but was and bob seger part of that pardon me was bob seger central to that bob seger was part of that too yeah okay so here's the thing. So when I came up, we were at we were like a generation after these guys, right? Mm -hmm. But they that that uh, MC5 DNA was so burned into my soul. So here's a great story. I was 22 probably, and my friends used to host this jam night at this bar on the east side of Detroit, and I would go because all the musicians from city would be there, and we'd all get up and play something, right? And so I went in there and I had my guitar and I'm sitting at my table drinking a beer with my, who's the guy who's now my brother-in-law. And, and at that time we were in a band together and I see Rob Tyner, the lead singer of the MC5 walk in and I'm like, he's going to play. And it was technically a hold my beer situation. I told Jay, I said, hold my beer. I'm going to go play. I'm going to go sit in with Rob Tyner. So I talked oh. myself on stage and I played, let me see if you guys can finish this sentence. This Kick is about the fifth the time we played it, Lindsay. You're wel welcome, Lindsay Rose. We're going to introduce you more. I'm going to get there. A go. I so like kick out the I'm jams. Okay. What comes next? Kick out the jams. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -mm. Do you know? Can you sing it? Can you sing it? No, it's kick the beginning. It, it, it just says. It just says kick out the jams. Well, no. If you grew up in Detroit in the seventies, okay, yeah, I don't know. 60s, I don't early know. 70s, you knew that that it goes kick out the jams, motherfucker, <laughs> which is how they started the song on this album, kick out the jams. And I played that song with Rob Tyner and this other song. Fun. And it was like, oh, I just landed. And uh, it, was a, it was a kind of a peak experience because I didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> awesome. For one thing. Or break any strings. But anyway, so that was kind of reminiscing about Wayne Kramer. He, he died yesterday of pancreatic cancer at the age oh, of seven. Well, that's what took my mom out at age 52. Well, those guys were still kicking around when I was... Yeah. A young man so but but rob tyner died i think they're down to one or two of the mc5 but uh well and uh the the rhythm guitar player for the mc5 fred smith was married to patty smith oh well we all know her and patty smith lived in the detroit area for the longest time did not know that yeah so anyway we're but we're not here to talk about that though i could we're here to bring back fan favorite Lindsay yes. Road. Shit, disproportionately. People uh Fan favorite. Yeah, some favorite. local listeners would say, like, who was that? I've never heard her name after she first came on. We talked about the underworld. That's kind of a trendy theme for the regenerate. And Lindsay, we gotta get into I've got two underworlds I want to talk to you about. Okay. And I think it's really I'm important. Really down. Yep. But um, yeah, and then uh Lin what Lindsay did is maybe from the podcast, uh, she took a deep dive with RJ Stewart and she immediately kind of understood. You know, another kind of fan favorite is the Stephen Clark. We'll have to have Stephen and Lindsay on together. And uh, Lindsay does this great mashup at her Twitter account. 
and also has a, a just a really wonderful article that I was privileged to read in the, the most recent edition, the most recent issue of Jesus, the Imagination. Welcome back, Lindsay. Thank you. Very happy to be here, gentlemen. Yeah. Um, yeah, where? Can we let's let's dive on in because I, I was talking to these people with breakfast this morning and our listeners can say, oh, OK, it's out of the way. You know, Mike word vomited again on this one. <laughs> two underworlds. Let's see. I think there's two underworlds. Yes. One is one is. And we had some correspondence, uh, listeners to the podcast and Michael, a little bit about feudalism. So listeners would know lately I'm festering that maybe possibly when I put together the ruminations of our friend Guido, um, I think it's there. Again, I've mentioned in uh, um, uh, the, 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 the Walt Whitman's essay on Shakespeare. There's a certain type of temperament, maybe a certain strand of thought. I think it tends to come from the American land and it might be our strand of thought that looks, they say, if there's feudalism in something, then it's got to go. Because for them, to a certain temperament, they say, this means even if we soften it up with just wonderful manners and we put a nice rosy hue on it, you know, it's still putting a boot on somebody's face. And then you have the Stephen Clark underworld. So feudalism would say we go into the underworld and we could think, I think two things about it. One has to do with the number of people involved. We could think of, and you clarify this for me, Lindsay, and this isn't, I'm not trying to portray yours. We could think of like dwarves and elves and kind of these subterranean gnomes and things. And they're cute, but we think of them as group entities. And then there's this other underworld, and but there's this the soft red hue on it. And I think it's more the Stephen Clark underworld. And you still have Our Lady of Guadalupe. But he says from the underworld tradition, we're getting things like jazz music, abstract expressionist art. You know, the best book on the icon I know, Elaine Bessoncott, is called The Forbidden Image. It ends with where's the iconography in today's world? And it's Kandinsky and abstract expressionism. You know, this would be anathema to the ortho bros. It comes up in 12 step spirituality. It comes up in like civil rights movements. And one thing about it is um, I'll mention that John Cowper Powys, you know, who walked, who walked America, he's a great underworld explorer, but he knew something new was being born. And I've mentioned this before. And he found it, if people want to look up Farewell to America, an essay Powys wrote, when he left. And it reminds me of what Peter Kingsley does with Young coming to New York. He mm -hmm. saw the same thing, metal, rock, and everything saw the same thing. But when Powies left, he said a new person was being born in Iowa or in the Midwest. And it was a person for whom from the British Isles was impregnated with the aura of the British class system, the upper, lower, middle class, and things like that. And he thought it stood in the way of anything good and noble and beautiful coming. And he thought in Iowa, the earth the American landmass and the earth, a divine feminine had given birth to somebody who was finally free of this horrible thing, you know? And so the idea was just call me John. And so in a, so we have the fruits of one, kind of counterintuitive, abstract expressionism, 12-step movement, civil rights. And then this underworld that I see in Stuart, which I myself partake of so much, where you have guided meditations and you go down stairwells that are very medieval feeling and you lift up old wooden doorways. Tell me how that resonates with you, Lindsay. You know, is it a distinction with a difference um, um, or is it meaningless? I, I don't know. For, for me personally, I wouldn't, I, I would probably disagree with Stephen that jazz and um, abstract art is an underworld feature. I was interesting. I actually just listened to the interview from him with you guys a couple of days ago. And I think, I really do think that there is a quality of like the disjointed astral that comes into effect with those types of, uh, especially, especially the idea of like, um, um the bright shiny towers and the the the, the rising of, of um non-land-based architecture or you know the mm -hmm. the things you see in like in New York with the Empire and the Chrysler building and stuff that this grand like uprising seems to be more of an astral let's let's do bad power Babylon let's go up higher and higher versus a sinking down into the earth which is where the underworld kind of comes into collapse so um I would say that I, I think that the underworld that to the I see I've been reading, I've been reading, I've read the Mexican mysteries that Stephen Clark wrote and which are great chapters and really informative and, and beautiful. Um, and I've also been reading a little bit of Henri Corban and mm -hmm. um, this idea that there's, there really are two darknesses, there really are two underworlds. There's that idea of like the, the frightening or the hellish realms. And then there's those that where you kind of go into the, the womb of the earth and the idea of the mother and this re- rebirth that can happen to the self that is you know the, the thing that you see with um 
you know, even, even the iconography of like Christ leaving um, the parrowing of hell is this beautiful like ent- exit out of the, the womb shape of the, the, you know, the Vesica Pisces and he comes back into the earth fully reborn and he's laid waste to the darkness that can, can feudalize the soul, right? So mm-hmm. I would start there. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I think that's important because uh, I think the Hobbit people, you know, the the distributors who don't actually do distributism, they just drink ale and smoke pipes. And <laughs> smoke pipes. We just got a comment this morning on our old show on distributism, Michael, where somebody said, like, you guys should just join Orthodoxy. You know, come willfully God. mishearing us. Willfully <laughs> mishearing us. <laughs> I always said, yeah. Oh, God. No, but... But, but it was a, a great is, listener. A great listener. Those guys, and they, I, they don't take the orcs seriously. You know, it's all... I'm taking them very seriously. It's, all, it's kind of like the proper it's like the wind in the willows version of uh the new age you know what i mean hmm. and oh, yeah. it kind of like idealizes it but yeah. i think the thing is and Lindsay, you're talking about is you know the other world is has just as many jerks <laughs> as this world does. and clark makes that clear I mean? so what yeah but what do you make of that yeah. Lindsay, you know, put what even you heard from clark you know they don't necessarily want you there and one other piece that i want to weave in here which is um that the underworld that's kind of dawning on me with this you know the themes of liberty the themes of uh um the end of feudalism and so forth it's it can look to us. Sometimes we have to want to want the right thing. You know, we're all familiar with that language. Yes, to want. But it would look to me at first take when we think of this Iowan. It's kind of boring, right? Where would there's another underworld look? Oh, it looks so colorful. And that's part of this this return to the Shire. People love it. It's got banners. You know, it's got gonflons and things like that. But right. this other one, if we get down two thousand years after the incarnation, where the the importance of like the gospel, the equality of all souls. Like if we really got to get down to what what is this gospel about? It doesn't mean the uniformity of all souls. I get it. No, absolutely but not. We're so we're so worried about the uniformity of all souls that I don't think we're willing to give liberty and this kind of Iowan thing that we could look more the same instead of just tattooing ourselves and so forth. Nothing wrong with that. I dress a certain way, but yeah. it looks boring. But to produce this thing, it could be we might need a, a higher artistic vision for abstract expressionism. I just don't know. No, it's the, the role of the individual is the thing I wanted to highlight. Then I'm done. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. Even the, this is something that that you know that um, both Kingsley talks about and you know, and Jung as well is like you know, the difference between individualism and individuation, mm-hmm. and that is an an individual is someone who tries to strike out as a unique you know. Often I feel like individualism has an ego pull to it to a certain extent. In in that if you look at all the different types of like um, groups out there, whether it's on Twitter or just in society. Even if even if you're going to be, you, you still belong to like this identification, right? And everyone mm-hmm. kind of has their uniform. If you're going to be a a beatnik or a poet, or you're going to be a jazz exactly. musician, or you're going to be, you know, into uh, what, what was I was going to say, like um, the business, beat, yeah, the hippie, the trans identified, right. whatever it is, everyone still to a certain extent begins to look the same. They can, you know, whether they dye their hair or they wear a certain suit or they will never touch, you know, non organic linen or whatever you know <laughs> all those different things individuation is a difference because it requires emotional maturity and you've had mm-hmm. to confront for one your own sins and your own soul and yeah. grappling with that to come actually out of childhood which is kind of like it's interesting when we see all that's happening in the world right now and you can kind of look at the state as a narcissistic parent because most of us haven't grown up yet mm-hmm. and coming to bear with that as an, ind- you know, and look at, look what we have with our colleges and Michael Martin can break me up here in academia. So can you, of course, the prolonged nature of adolescence and pathological adolescence that's happening in our society, Let's say you're helping crazy. no one. And they're, they're, instead of having heroes, even like John, you know, John Power Powers, and I grew up in Iowa. So it's kind of funny to hear you say that we had, we used yeah. to sing songs about Iowa gold and it was the heartland and the soul was there, the world mm-hmm. and all those things. And-, and people want to escape it, but what are they escaping from? You know, if it's all these questions interest me. No, this is great because then this is why I've been really, this is what has been really powerful for me with the idea of the underworld, both with RJ Stewart's and the Celtic and the kind of the fairy lore that happens even into the Gnostic texts and this, the, the Ballymote and, and, and the, uh, was it the Bruce Codex have these like mapping systems that create this, this, you know, the, the circular labyrinthine or even the, the cubistic quality of that. What's really been powerful is to see how most, and maybe this is kind of the run-in we're having at this 2000 years post you know, resurrection is that 
everyone is looking up. Everyone's constantly trying to escape Agreed. out the top hatch. And what I love about the idea of the underworld and even you read like Dante is there's a road to appearing at the bottom of hell, right? There's, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes you have to go all the way to the bottom to find your way back out. And that's maybe the point. Right. And this, and you mentioned well, this, this is people, people don't want to grow up. And we, I see it all the time. I actually had an interesting conversation with one of my classes this week because uh, they're trying to pick out things to write an argument about. And there's some female athletes in there. And I was talking to them about having trans athletes compete against them and how that makes them feel. <laughs> and, how does that make you feel? Well, no, because of, you yeah, know right, they, right. You just they're lost, afraid you just to talk about it. They're yeah. afraid. I don't, they're, right. they're afraid to say I don't like this, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I was. I try to in my classroom create an environment where, and I told them they even asked me, "Do you tell your us your opinions here?" I said, "Well, in class like this, you might get my opinions. When I teach in literature, you get my opinions about literature, but." I, you know, what I'm trying to do is, you know, I, I'm like, I'm old school. And so I'm the kind of professor who wants this to be a marketplace of ideas and you can test out what you think in here and in someone might disagree, but that's okay. It doesn't mean I hate you. Right. More of that. And, yeah. and they were like, this is a new concept to us. But, <laughs> uh, but I think the other thing we're talking about with the underworld or the other world or whatever you want to call it right is and i, I actually i've been thinking about this lately because because i i wrote a couple last week i think it was i wrote that piece on olivia cheney mm -hmm. after we did our interview with her she's lovely she is. she is lovely and we've been corresponding a little bit and and I didn't, I didn't, I was just thinking about it because, you know, one of the my touchstones in that article I wrote about her was the kind of similarities to where her place in Yorkshire to where I live. But the difference is, I think this little cottage they have in Yorkshire, it's got to be 500 years old. It's super old, maybe 400 years old, but it's 300. I've got things it's to still, say about that. Yeah. But it's older than this country. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? right. So it's weird. And, and, Lindsay knows this because I just wrote a book of poetry about it that inhabits and uh, investigates a lot of this. This and um, uh, mythologies of the wild of God. Part of the, what I do in that is try to investigate or see what stories live in this landscape. Yes. Right. And I think there are resonant. And now it's going to come from me. It's not a little bit Celtic because I have a lot of Celtic in sure. my blood. Right? Bring it. But I think think you see it in the Celtic mythology that there's something really ancient there. And I think what, and what I think, if you look at England, you know, in England, myth, you know, legends and especially fairy tales and fairy lore, it's much more domesticated because England has been civilized for a lot longer. Than it's a United huge States. part. That's part and of where the I want US to go. Yeah. Has not, I mean, this, this, this yeah. the weird thing about the US is this continent has not been civilized for all that long. Yet in a way there's a, kind of patina or surface structure of hyper civilization but it's not it's not grounded right so that's what one of the things i learned through that the process of writing those poems is there's there's a there's an ancientness and a a you know an otherworldliness of this landscape that has hardly been ex explored at all no, Amen. I, love, well I love this. I love this very much because I one of the things I have always wanted to do, or I feel even reading, you know, all the Celtics that I've been reading as of the last year or two, and diving into Peter Kingsley, who's also a Brit who came to the U.S. for quite a number of years and is now back in Europe, and even and Stephen Clark's work as well, is that I, I remember even in in grad school reading a collection of of Native American philosophy. I forget who the author is, and forgive me, I'm so sorry. Um, but they, they the question is, if this is your land, where are your stories? And this idea of creating a narrative of what it means to be America or to be part of this landscape, what it means to be indigenous to a place because you've been born of the earth that's there. And I I go, so where a lot of America, especially European, European indigenous, you know, ancestry, we're kind of orphans in a way because we've kind of shut off ourselves, unless you are a first or second generation, you know, um, um, you know, here you had a parent come or you have, you know, still family alive back in, you know, Italy or Germany or something. You don't have the connection of that landscape. You don't have the connection of where all of your blood comes from it has been severed to a certain extent. So having to re 
associate ourselves with a place, I go, well, so where's my going America? Where's my you know, green night? Where do I find the stories here that initiate mm-hmm. me to this place that are still part of that grand cosmology? Yeah, and I, Michael, you both hit it out of the park for me, thinking that um, this Powie's essay on Farewell to America, you know, I, I just think it's fun as we're also bored in school. He's conjecturing that like, you know, the Isles, the British Isles, that you have salt water lapping up on them all the time. It's drawing some of the magnetism that's not drawn from, say, the American heartland that he felt, right? And we need to be able to think like this and feel those things. And he would walk, he knew the difference between when you, you got close to the Rockies, the Tilleric Force was there, and what was going on in other places for real. And um, the other one, and you you alleged it, Mike, is about gardens, you know, that in Europe, you know, I mean, we've they've worked with nature so much and they've kind of intermingled and they live in an ante room that if you leave an English garden behind for a couple of weeks, it's going to be fine. But if you and I leave our gardens for a couple of weeks, like Mother Nature, she's encroaching really quickly. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a, crazy. It's crazy. It's wilder here. Yeah, it's, it's wilder. wilder. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. There's a permaculturist I used to study, and he would say that the idea that the settlers who came to the U.S. and went from east to westward expansion thought they had come upon this amazing new growth of amazing fruits and vegetables, and these, these amazing, you know, almost Edenic qualities of food across the plains. And what they actually were suddenly into was like, you know, the food forests that the, that the indigenous populations had created here, and they had actually cultivated off the land prickly pear and things like it grew, like, you know, inter, 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 inter yeah. There and it was so it wasn't it wasn't wilderness or there really wherever humans have been wilderness gets you know uh, cinched a little bit but you hopefully for the the ben, the co benefit of all species and not for like you know look at our That's our dust bowl situation the third, it took us what like less than a, you know 170 years to completely obliterate our soil like it, it didn't happen it didn't take long it's <laughs> crazy no. so you're saying Lindsay but, you're just go ahead Michael yeah no I mean it, it's that uh, it's a weird thing because. And I, spe- I think especially in contemporary American culture, it's, and you can see this, um, I think particularly in the gender stuff, but in particularly the softening of the male, is that there's a, there's a real fear of the wild. There's a fear of wildness, and as a result, everything kind of gets flattened, and the wildness is still there. And I think that's when you see, you know, the you know, the, these uh, upsurges of violence, uh, it's almost, you could look at it, you know, if you look at it really a more bigger picture, it's like, uh, and even mass shootings or stuff like that, in a way, it's a kind of uh, psychic Relief. eruption, psychic kind of. eruption, because usually the people who do that are either on medication for psychotropic medication, or they I mean, by personality. Yeah, no, no, no. No, no, at hundred percent. But there is an interesting Stephen Harabuna. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He was an, a master herbalist. He died a, a few years ago, I think, really recently after COVID. But he was like a lived in New Mexico for a long time, and I used to listen to his talks, his lectures, and um, he would discuss the fact that even how we walk into the woods these days, you know, we're going, we go hiking and you know, it's you're up in the mountains and stuff, and we go on these long walks. Urban because, we, because we have eliminated so much of the large predator mammals, we don't think about walking into, unless you're in like, you know, Wyoming or like Montana, you're not going to go find a black bear on your trail necessarily, or a moose or or a cougar. I mean, it definitely happens, especially in the Rockies up here, but like we walk into the woods banging and clamoring, thinking there's nothing out there but us. And so we've kind of lost a sense of awareness when we walk out there. We're not, we're not present. We are some, we're, we're, you know, talking and we, we don't actually have our presence with us when we are actually navigating the world. I think that's one of the things that we our, our culture these days is, is running through issues of meaninglessness and and what what is what is how do I deal with life when there's been the loss when there's we're going through this this catapult of into transhumanism versus the real human heart you know this is the synthetic life that that's kind of being presented as one this is the better one you know we don't even understand the difference because we've been so um trying to get out that the, the escapism has been so strong that we don't even know how to ground down and go discern this is what's real this is what isn't and i think that's part of the idea we don't actually know how to wrestle with our own darkness our own danger and Mm -hmm. so you know wandering wandering into the wilderness or wandering to the underworld is kind of the same thing because there's a wilderness outside of us and there's Mm -hmm. kind of one on the inside of us as well that you have to learn how to navigate right absolutely um territory as the saying goes right (laughs) what'd you say 
the map is not the territory. Yeah, right, right, yeah. No, that meant because there's a lot of time, you know, for people who are not familiar with hunting, for instance, you know, you the the consciousness you have to get into to be successful at it is you don't just go out there. <laughs> you have to, you know, um, what's his name? Uh Ortega y Gasset, the the Spanish philosopher in his book, Meditations on Hunting. He calls it a vacation from modernity, from the human experience, because you kind of enter back into nature. You're more, you're a part of nature again, mm -hmm. and you then you realize how in, well enormously difficult it is, and then you have you have to ad, 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 adapt or adopt a, a new kind of consciousness yeah. that is difficult to do. Which is actually it was interesting to say, to, interesting to say that because so many of the poems in, in my new book were written in the deer blind, which is why okay. deer appear so much. I in had the some time. Book. I laid in some stanzas. Yeah, but it's like <laughs> no one's bugging me. No one's going to interrupt. Uh, uh, but 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 another thing you're we're reminding, and I saw this recently in an interview with Jordan Peterson, and I think he was he's right because he he was talking about men have to be dangerous. But they have to know how to control it. What a good man actually is. Yeah, a good man is a dangerous yeah. man. Just how to keep his self in check, you right. know, until the appropriate timing. A good man is often, what we decide is good. If you're not a dangerous man, you're no threat to anybody and you're not going to protect, protect what anybody. What about the affectation, Lindsay, of the, the affected dangerous man? Isn't that going to be a cultural thing? I mean, all of these phenomena from the right just give huh. birth to affectations, whether it's like Catholic manhood, Nicorette gum, a pipe, and a beard. Um, whether well, yeah, everyone honestly, has their uniform, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody. Yeah. So it's not. I'm not raising an objection at all. But it's the 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 surrogacy of the wild is just so crazy now. But it's yeah. like it's, right. It's crazy. And then what do women think of that, Lindsay? When you see it, what do you think of that? You see it's a maturity like, thing too, right? That they're not. They haven't grown up. Presumably. I think there's a lot of people who, and I don't. I want. I don't want to obviously cast aspersions on people, but like. There's a level. I find of, it all too easy. Yeah. I'm trying to like, like, how do I talk around this correctly? There's such an, a natural condition level of performance. I feel like we have, and mm -hmm. we've taken on as a society. The world's a stage, Shakespeare, but it's even yeah. not even in a political sphere. But like, so many people have, you know, and maybe it's because like my dad died last year, oh, and I'm like, sorry. and and then so like, I I have to, I really wrestled this idea of like, you know, what. How do you deal with the brokenness that you feel inside of you when you're wandering around outside? And who, how are you? And you, no one wants to actually know about the brokenness inside or the hurt qualities of things, you know? So you're having to learn how to navigate. This is the play, this is a performance I put out in front of my company or my, you know, my colleagues, my employer. This is how I do it around family or on people who might not be that the realm, the, the, the levels of walls that, that the levels of Jericho inside of us that collapse down into that sad, small child heart that just wants to be you know, to be at one with whether you God or the mother or, you know, the, however you want to, to discuss it, you know, it's like, from a Christian standpoint, it's, it's like, go lay your head in the lap of Mary, you know, it's like the, just that, that quality of being, it's all going to be okay. Things are right. going to get better. And you look at the world and you go, it doesn't really look like that out here, you know? And so mm -hmm. that there's a that wrestling of dissonance of how do you make plans? How do you strive for meaning? You know, and some, some, some of these, 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 all these, these, um, you know, fitness bros, or, you know, it's this very much this masculine performance. Fitness I mean, bros. you know, there's, well, there's, there's this quality of like, they have so much en energy and, and vibrancy yeah. and we so need that, but it also needs to be directed. And I feel like what's so funny about being at the whole idea of like the trad bros is like this, you know, the pipe and <laughs> the suspenders. And it's almost, I, I almost blame, I almost blame the hipster thing that started in 2008, 2009, like an out, outset of Blame that. it on Mumford and Sons, right? I love them for I do too. I do too. They went electric. Yeah. I love them, but that's the whole yeah. Bob Dylan argument, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. But there, there's that quality of I see happening is the pendulum swing is so easy to find that in our society, especially right now, between God, even between the sexes, if you mm -hmm. if you go trad bro and all the girls, you're gonna eventually find what happened in like you know the the suffragette movement. You know, I feel that one of the biggest issues that we have. And this, this is a little off topic. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm soapboxing. It's great. It's great. <laughs> is that women, especially, I mean, this is part of the whole idea of what the American landscape, the wilderness that's here can maybe reteach us is that every single person wants to have value. They want to contribute value to their family, to their, you know, good hearted people. Obviously people, some people are just lazy and they don't want to do anything, but most people want to be of value to their site, to their world, to their families. 
And I think one of the biggest problems that happened with the kind of the erasure of the feminine was when the, the idea, who was, who are you talking to? It's actually, I was off from one of your podcasts. Was it um, Matthew Milliner? Is that his name? He's great. Yeah. He's yeah. wonderful. And he was talking about- Chesterton the, and Native Americans. Right. And the, the 12th, like the 12th century, what was happening yeah. in like 12th, 11th, 12th century Europe and this flowering of this really integrated, beautiful concert. You see that in Hildegard von Bingen's work and all of these beautiful things. And then all of a sudden between that and like Victorian Britain, you get this like, this complete removal of the feminine's value to society. And when that happens, because some of us ladies are fiery, we go, well, fine. Well, we want to be of value. So where's the value you see? We will, we'll go participate there. Right. You know, we are, women are naturally, yes, we're nurturers, but not every single woman's meant to be say, a mother necessarily, but we are transmitters of culture. We do, we're gossipers. We we spread stories. We spread civilization. We we teach our children spirituality and religion as like, as like heart milk, right? So when you remove something that wants that to be of value and you demote it, you're going to find it wants to erupt somewhere else, just like the violence some that you see in these things. This this natural valve that needs to happen when the feminine is is reduced. You get things like figures like you know like um, Boudicca and Kali. You they're going they're going to come back to erect their 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 importance. So you remember that the male and female is meant to work together. So, well, and I think what we, what you see is all the, these examples you were given, Mike. Um, these are in, in the you know the the distributist bros with the pipes. Um, those are caricatures. Yes, they're Where's not authentic. And I, and when you guys are talking, we got to go back to that. Circle back to authenticity. So go, most go. of my friends yeah. around here, my friends in the city are different. They, I've, very often, people in the city are plagued by all kinds of modern ailments <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> but out here the guy the, the guys i know and i see most of the time and it's not everybody out here but it's the people i see on a regular basis are are are, are dangerous men who have it under control um i was just for instance i saw one of them yesterday so my sons uh are into archery and shooting sports and stuff and i took him it was a really cool thing they have at the sporting goods place here in, in jackson and so I was there and I see my friend who is actually a lumberjack and, <laughs> and, and, you know, and every time we talk, you know, I get with him and I get with the Amish and the only thing we talk about with the weather and hunting, right. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, farming and stuff like that. And these are guys that could kill you, but you would never, they would, you would, they would never intimidate you. They were just super uh, confident, but gentle souls. Isn't that the definition of good, of good knighthood, though? That's where I was going. Yeah, it's exact. That's the Christian knighthood, right? Yeah. Because that's that's Galahad. That's Lancelot. I could kill you, but I, but I won't. But I have their chivalry, right? And it's in those stories, right? It's the guys who don't follow the code who are the bad guys, who are the phonies, who are the 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 dangerous people who need to be taken out, right? And this yeah. is how it, and I think really that's just, that is, so. It's nothing new. To have posers. <laughs> well, there's always been there's always been facade. That's even the the word of glamour. Agreed. The word glamour and grammar come together, right? This idea of gr grimoire, or grimaria, it's, it's magic. It's 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 like you know, it's the performance. It's it's the illusion of things, and mm -hmm. you seem to be really really good at that in modernity. But there's, it, I think, we're going to run into an issue of as things become more and more synthesized and more and more AI and more technological people are really going just to keep their sanity are going to really seek out what's actually real. If you can't be real, then you're not really trustworthy because you're part of a. That's where it all CD. circles back again. Yeah. You know, again, like we're all, we're, I totally agree. We all have a certain number of facades and so forth, but when we critique, when we're <laughs> critiquing a certain form of ortho bro, it's a matter of degree, not an argument about. And there time. are lovely ortho bros out there as well. There are, there are. I'm but not the, um, arrows here. But, but could we say again that like this, is it possible? Like to the degree to we might be able to get rid of feudalism. We maybe we can do, um, but is it possible that like when we talk about the younger generation, I think this is Generation Z, you know, that despite <laughs> it being ubiquitous in their generation, this desire for authenticity, right? There's only one evil and it's hypocrisy. But, you know, that's um, that that yearning. I always say, you know, can we we talk about like hypocrisy in a little way being vice paying tribute to virtue just a little bit, you know, but <laughs> I don't mind the push for more and more and more authenticity, because I think 
that new type of human being. Now you tell me, Lindsay, because you lived in Iowa, and it's not every Iowan, and I'm not trying to put them on a pedestal, but it can look boring. But the need for our species to get to that authenticity of just, you know, call me John, that might be the that might be the force. And that's why under the guise, like the worst being the corruption of the best, everybody's buying their authenticity now, but it, it's vanishing. It's vanishing. It's like the- uh, It's cosmetic, right? Yeah. It's yeah. cosmetic. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, John Carter um, Powis, and then you have also like you have John Muir coming from the Midwest and the yeah. back of New Hampshire coming into the West and, you know- trying everyone is looking for that thing that makes them feel whole right and mm -hmm. and i think that modernity has given so many band-aids for what wholeness looks like that yeah. we mm -hmm. don't recognize that we're still wounded oh, yeah. no, well, we're not doing the, but the main thing is as larry mentioned last time we talked to him or before we got booted off the platform because larry when, larry well, well larry was not it was right because he was fine he was fine people right. want authenticity right they want but they want to buy it. They don't want to go through the darkness to get there. And, that, and that's right. the thing that RJ that's Stewart a, writes part. so well in one of his texts, um, which is the the fact that to be actually like followers of the, our, you know, our of of Christ is to follow Him, not just worship. Which is means I mean, when you go into the etymology of that, excuse me. <clears throat> It actually means to the desire to become. And Mercy used to say, be careful what you worship because that you will become that thing. Worship is a quality of wanting to become like what you are in relationship to. On the other way of saying it, though, is that, um, oh my gosh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> you were saying, you know, it's, it's, you were saying how like Christ didn't say, do this, do that. He said, follow oh, he me. Said, he said, yeah, yeah he, he said, he said follow me, come come with me. And and the great thing about both, both RJ Stewart and Stephen Clark and Henry Corbon is this idea that you have you have to become we have to become reoriented to where we actually are and most people are wandering around kind of in a stupor still whether it's right. to avoid pain whether it's because they were told this is how you get your experience of God this is how you do the things correctly by tradition and there's there becomes that the roteness has I may, maybe to a certain extent to a certain extent infiltrated so much that we forget what it feels like to want it. And I have a synthetic statement, which could be yeah. that the evangelicals, the Catholics were more prone. This is an overgeneralization to say like, do this, do this, not follow the evangelicals. They, they say it like Jesus didn't come to say, do this. He said, follow me, but oh. they're not following him through the underworld. Is that, no, that, and that that's, the whole, that's the whole point. They're what, not yeah, doing yeah, the work. Right. The whole point yeah, is, yeah. and like, <clears throat> I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to go like, like super esoteric on it, but the idea, even that, we were, Jesus always says that, you know, these and greater things you shall do in my name, right? And then the people use that as a, as a blanket for doing all kinds of things or, or to negate their power to do things at the same time, which always confuses me. But the whole point is if we're all going to do the work, then let's all do the work. The idea, my, my issue with a lot of the staunch evangelical community is the, I, my faith is there. I said, I believe these things. I'm good to go. And there's not really, really a, and I'm not, again, not saying all things, but from the outside, as it's, especially as a teenager, I was wrestling with, well, what do I do with this Bible thing, this book, right? Was there's so much, I, there's nothing that we can do. This is very much a reformers the kind of qualities that there were so, human beings are so depraved that they, we can't do anything good on our own. Whereas a Catholic and the Orthodox keep that, I think that imager quality still kind of inside them that, there's power in the spark that was been given to us as images of God, right? And and that um, we have to go do the same things, not just he took care of it, you know, the bumper stickers, you know, the book said it, that's it, I believe it, and we're done. I think that faith is meant to, faith is a verb. Belief, I think, is kind of a more mental construct. You, you kind of buy into an idea, but faith is something you have to do with your whole body. And I just don't, I think we kind of have, lost the the incarnation of ourselves Probably this great underworld novel porius i just think when you said I haven't read that oh it's great you know it's 900 pages it's really oh, small you know type. i can but, get through it um it's what he did yeah but he uh he has you know it's just a great role for pelagius in that right and i've written a lot on like my i could have a bumper sticker that said like father forgive me i'm pelagian as well as Augustine. <laughs> like, but, yeah, well, i mean yeah i have augustine and pelagius in my breast you know they have that's right. that's everybody should everybody should and pelagius also got a bad rap in history uh, Powys was very familiar with that, but he's an underworld figure. Pelagius. Yes, yeah, yeah. You no, know, very much. Where so. the other one, Augustine, was a little more transactional, as they say today. He was aware of that. Like, there's a doctrine of infant baptism that will actually like really fill the pews, folks. 
You know, <laughs> well, I honestly, mean, that's in, they, they can prove that. They can prove that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a Japanese uh, Augustine scholar, uh, Yamoto is his last name, or I forget. Uh, but he's they've you know we're so blessed that they've recovered in recent memory some documents of Pelagius, right? So we can yes. hear because um, it's all through Augustine. But you do get a sense that like oh, infant baptism, like you're you're technically outside the fold, but you hear that unless you get this thing, <coughs> baptism, you're going to spend eternity in hell. That's what like Romanides would say is the disease of religion, which Jesus came to cure. Because later on, that becomes obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Do this for that. Right. Everything's transactional. Because we're anxiety that's, inducing, yeah, right? Everything's so transactional. And that's yeah. what really I, I find very troubling in ortho bro and tradism and etc. I mean, you see, but it's not just that, it's just human condition, right? Is if I just do the right stuff, right? Yeah, no, I, have if I just tick off all the boxes. I got the, okay, spiritual father, check. Fast like a maniac during Lent, check, right? Uh, I'll you check all the, all the boxes and like Michael well, Martin doing uh, stand up, which you see, but you see the same thing in those kids who go to get top and bottom surgery and they're still unhappy. Yeah, right. This is mm -hmm. the real. That's no, you can't find fulfillment by checking off a bunch of boxes. Right. Yeah, that's a great as, insight. I would say you have to meet the guardian at the threshold, and you're going to meet him yes. more than one. Right. That's what really you have well to go said. through. You have very to well. face the dragon, right? Yeah, yes, very much so. And so, you have this in all of the early myths too. You have, you know, Apollo wrestling with Python and mm -hmm. and Thor and Jogmandir. You have this this quality of <laughs> not just not just the idea of of the serpent or nature of you know time or the nature of chaos. These, these are all things that become you know an issue. And even like going back to your point about the idea of feudalism, it's like if Jesus came to speak against empire. How and yet heaven is a hierarchy and a kingdom. How do how do you wrestle with how to implement that? You know, while we're hanging out here and trying to do the best little human lives that we can to avoid putting boots on faces, and yet hierarchy seems to be naturally occurring. Even when, even when you look at nature and you watch how soil becomes, you know, bodies become soil, and the cycle continues. I think we get it. Like that came up at breakfast this morning. You know that we just say hierarchy reforms but when you think about it like i think ezra pound despite his anti-semitism you know you could read his poetry but even like the the yeah me too but yeah. like just this symbol of usury the symbol of usury this infiltrates our brains folks you know that like once you just get used to just drawing off somebody else whether it's a scorpion spite or whether it's a boot on the head that i think we can do a lot a lot more and that's essentially why guido preparata walks this planet he said, you know, that we haven't, we've accepted, we've accepted way too much and we mythologize it and we enshrine yes. it before yes. we've done anything to try and rid ourselves of it. So instead of getting, you know, so root, you know, usury spatializes time for one thing, right? There's this relentless ticking that like, if I have money, it's sitting in the bank, you know, it's sitting and breeding like rabbits, as Shakespeare said, which was a big lie. And um, <laughs> the... Well, it's the lie. It's the foundation. No, it is one of lie. the biggest. Yes, absolutely. You think your ducats yeah. sit in a bank and breed like rabbits, you know. True. And so, um, the and some of these other things that were our what we're calling our faith, Lindsay, wants to move to like, can we at least keep turning some of this over? But so much of what constitutes religion in our day is just reifying those things, and we're putting a like a soft patina on them because the people who are in the underclass living on the manors in in France. It finally broke out in the French Revolution. Like they weren't as happy as we thought they were. Now it's not to crap on the Middle Ages, totally, right? I'm not somebody who just like a Protestant would say the whole thing was tyranny. But, and I also want to make the case, if we were supposed to be getting rid of the last vestiges of feudalism, it has to go with, you know, complete total nonviolence. But also we would, I'm not saying you should take it on a didactic argument. We're starting to see this stuff. Is it arising in the poets? Look at Shelley. It's all there. It's yeah. there. And it's beautiful. And so the, the new mythology is like the word liberty. You know, you had a beautiful picture of a tree, you know, God's returned, an old tree, Lindsay, on your Twitter. But sometimes this idea of like these, you know, liberty, humility, kindness, these are gods in our time, the new paganism or something. But I, you know, I don't know. I, I think we, we give up too, too quickly on what we might be able to undertake if we started ridding ourselves of these great pathologies. Well, I, I think I, I totally agree. And I think that goes back to the fact that a lot of, our culture modernity is a prolonged adolescence and yeah. and that you know 
I had a, I had a professor in college who I adored and he taught me that he was a, a Bible and literature program um, teacher. And he had, um, he'd been a missionary. He had traveled over, he'd been in China, he'd been in Africa with his wife. Um, he actually had, you know, learned Hebrew and Greek to the point where he like translated like the Old Testament for himself as well. Uh, yeah, right. And then he, and my eyes like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. and he goes, everyone just wants someone to say, these are the rules. Go to these rules, you'll be fine. It's to tell what you do, and I'll do it. There, there's there's so much an abdication yeah. of responsibility and 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 actual like presence as a embodied being. There's a tell what you do to get my page. There's so much transactional quality in our life, and especially that we, yeah, we we give up things far too quickly for and for convenience, for a paycheck, for um, you know, just 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 to leave me alone. Right, which is right. probably more the case with so many people in this country, because they're just telling you to do to have you all leave me alone. Um, but there's an application of knighthood, warriorship, well, they they outsource, that comes up with those things. They outsource their own authority, right? And if you're <laughs> I don't want a responsibility to take. I don't I can't take make a decision. Because... You just tell me what to do, right? Yeah. So here, I think we've actually bumped into it. The other thing I wanted to talk about was. I've been asking for a month or so now, you know. What is Lindsay? Um, what does Lindsay owe you, Michael? Well, no, it's not Lindsay. I've been asking in general, and oh. even if this popped up. I asked the question a month ago on Twitter, and it popped up again in the last couple of days. Is uh, I don't know why. It's probably Maybe. from those those fem bots who go there and oh, God, they're it everywhere, up. like black. They're they <clears throat> black, but anyway, uh, is is Christianity? Uh, something we can organically discover or and this is this is a big question right or do you know how does it can you can you under can you can it be discovered organically how oh, how, how controversial of me to get michael is no, Kurt, go for it this is the regeneration my, my just don't what, mention COVID yeah, my first question, i won't i won't use i won't use <laughs> red, red flag words but um what my first question would be what do you mean by organically how would you define organically can you discover it in going into the underworld? Put it that way. Okay, fair enough. I would say that um, if you want to go into the theophanic tradition, even in, I'll, I'll go ortho bro on this. If you want to go into that, um, Abraham did not need, uh, had something appear to him. Uh, Moses did a good job by that. So did Paul. So the idea that you need to have the, right. what was great about the idea of like Henry Corbon, who was a, um, both a, pro a French Protestant philosopher and 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 uh, became very invested in like the Neoplatonist tradition within um, Sufism. He talks a lot about the fact that the divine is constantly reaching. There's always an infiltration, but you have to kind of meet it halfway. So I, I think that the, the idea of the angelic, the idea of this, this quality of Inter intermission that happens, you know, what well, used to happen in the Old Testament all the time, and all of a sudden we come to this place, Nicene Creed, that the Spirit only shows up when we're all gathered under Constantine's edict, you know, and that uh, after that it can't happen <laughs> ever again. I think is misleading, and this, this is this is my where I kind of ride the fence between like you know Socratic Anglicanism and and more traditional things. Is like the when I when I go and I read. Um, the place where Jesus says, you know, who they say I am. And Peter jumps in and goes, you're the son of the living God. And he goes, my father gave that to you on that. And, and then next thing he says, on this rock, I shall build my church. But he's not, for me, reading that as a, my little mystic self that I am, it's that moment of divine, immediate intervention revelation that the church is built on. That moment of absolute knowing that it's given by the divine, by God, in that moment that it's complete knowing it. there's no belief necessary because he knows i know who you are you can't believe in who someone is you have to know them for have an actual relationship with them otherwise it's performance right so the idea that or, or the christianity can be ex ex discovered really depends on how you ex you expect the creation the creator and the the anointed logos to act in terms of you right. know each individual soul and whether if they're all in if they're all worth saving and they're not like just you know god sitting over here in the corner going well apologize you know <laughs> and then we'll both we'll see um but there's actually an, an investment of grace that happens then i mean i remember being um i think it was my last year of undergrad and i was in a religious studies course um and we we're discussing all manners of things and i realized i brought in like the runaway bunny 
I go, this is a, this is, this is a mystical tale. This is, this is a, a religious story because what happens with the mother said, well, he, little boys, little rabbit goes, oh, I wanted to go do this. She says, well, if you do this, if you become this, I'll become a fisher. If you become a fish, I'll become a fisherman. If you become a mountain, I'll become a mountaineer. I will find, I will come after, I will oh, pursue you no matter where you go. And, and I'm always here. If something happens, I'm always here. And the kid keeps, you know, trapeze artists and, this, and he, keeps, he keeps escaping. And finally he runs into the house and he goes, well, can I just be a bunny? Can I just be your son? Yeah. And she goes, of course. And they hug and that's the end. It's, it's, it's really sweet. Tale, but that really, that's how I kind of, I've experienced. Yeah, Francis Thompson's the hound of heaven too, right? Yes. You, you know, know he was an opium I'm addict and everything. And just, yeah, I stalked you down the alleyways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think that um, Christianity ha has blossomed in the Western tradition on the foundation of, I'm sorry, this people off on the foundation of, the Greek mystery schools, Orphis, or you know, Orphism, the Celtic nature of all the Druids, you know, that come and and that that mm -hmm. come into even parts of you know France and the and and what will later become Palestine. There, there's there's a quality of synthesis that and I don't not synchronization, but it is a synthesis of experiences that you have to go down to go up. You yeah. have to kind of you know whether you you know Peter Kingsley discussing Parmenides coming confronting Persephone, mm -hmm. you know the the mother of the dark places of the dead where people come and, 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 and lie, you know, and back then in the idea of Greece, there's no idea of heaven yet. There's, there, there's the Elysium, right? There's that, the, right. there's paradise, but you're not going to become, you don't, paradise is very different than say becoming an Olympian and becoming immortal. It's mm -hmm. a very different, you know, even that right. is a really interesting kind of construct. Where, where does the afterlife lead you? But this idea that, or kind of almost into Lent season, right? This idea that Jesus comes all the way down. Mm -hmm. all the way down to make sure that even down to the smallest cell of creation gets reignited and then the ascension happens. So I feel like if we're not willing to kind of go down to foundations, we're mm -hmm. going to have a really hard time building new houses, new temples, new cathedrals in a post modernity or alternative modernity that needs it so badly. That was Lindsay yeah. Rose, ladies and gentlemen, that was brilliant. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, that's always worth the price of admission. That's it's right. it's it's only you, Lindsay. You're the only one saying that stuff so clearly, you know. But the yeah. but, you know, don't you think? <laughs> one quick thing is the like, you know, lately in my thinking, you know that um, and this is Powisian too, but the again like um, doing right because it's right. You know, the system of rewards and so forth. Right. This is this is a theme of where we are now, which is also an underworld theme. But the uh, the other one is like when Illich says. That even the beatitudes in our time are almost becoming, you know, none of us love the word because we beat on science so much, scientifically provable. That mm -hmm. um, you can see these things. So we're in an era where there's no such thing. We're just talking about truth. There's no such thing anymore as a set aside religious truth. And that gets to Michael's question about is Christianity kind of provable? You know, which you unpacked brilliantly. Well, well and I think also what happens is. Uh... I mean, it's a, there is I mean, there's a tension. You know, it can't it's you can't eradicate it. This tension between the intuition and mystical insight yes. and authority, right? Mm -hmm. And something that brought was brought to my attention in a really striking way. So Bonnie is on Saturdays. She has a Torah study group. She does with some some ladies in the neighborhood. Cool. And she always brings. She's got a, a King James Bible. She brings, but she also brings the Septuagint. And one of the readings they did a few weeks ago was Proverbs 3. So check it out. I got to read this to you. It'll blow your mind. From the so, Septuagint? Here, Proverbs 3. This is from the King James. Uh, okay. through Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Pick up your Bibles. <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That's what it says in the King James, which might like most Bob Bibles is translated from the Masoretic text. Mm -hmm. But here's what it says in Septuagint, which is not. This will this is kind not of the Masoretic, my... yeah, they're very different in places. Here it is. Trust in, in God with all thine heart, and be not exalted in thine own wisdom. In all thy ways acquaint thyself with her. Mm -hmm. Wisdom. With her that she may rightfully direct thy paths. I mean, that's a pretty radical difference in translation, people, right? And that's from the Septuagint, which predates the Masoretic text. 
Um, now, some people, I don't know if this is true, I'm not a biblical scholar, uh, suggest that the Masoretic text arose in Jewish communities as a is damage control once the, once Christianity can give into play. I think it's true, the right? First time. I mean, if you talk to uh, um, stop the poetry, Margaret stop Barker, the poetry. Right? Margaret Barker's, you know, people act like no, the and this is like the, the mythology in this in in a not good way about the Old Testament, which has never been changed or edited. Ha ha ha! Yes, it has, right? Uh, just like the New Testament has, because you know it, the victors write history people right that's how it works right don't pretend it didn't happen with the bible but that's an interesting it says so, an extra when they come back from battle they're rewriting the book sorry that's what happens though when you have a decentralized model like and that's why you know i i spent so much time thinking about the early celtic church which was on the fringes of the empire out of, nobody was bothering with them so it kind of happened organically and we just celebrated St. Bridget's Day, for instance, right? And uh, because that was so organic in a way there, it was almost like when we talked to Matthew Milliner, speaking of him, you know, there are, are some Native American traditions, you know, when the missionaries came here with Christianity, like, oh yeah, that guy, we, we he was here already, yeah, right? right. And actually, remember when we talked to Sarah Height about, I don't know, a year and a half ago, I just I talked to her a couple of days ago, her husband was she was AI was, AI lady the AI lady yeah, but her right. husband uh is used to go around the United States finding petroglyphs that were ancient written in Paleo Hebrew and and he actually he did the same thing in Petro if you know where Petra is Petra is the the cool place where in where Indiana Jones finds yeah, the Holy right. Grail in, in right Lebanon. and he was there too in fact when they were living in the Holy Land he was going there and he was again collecting some some of this information from petra and actually from the mountain they say that is really the mountain which is in saudi arabia that where moses received the ten commandments he brought me a couple rocks from there mm -hmm. and it's kind of cool because they're like sandstone but the outside is scorched black let's think about that <laughs> Talk about the that's heavy i'll never forget the moment in a in a, a graduate level a uh, Hebrew Bible class, when the professor put before that you were talking about the Masoretic text, which for our listeners has vowel accents where previously there hadn't been. But I remember he used the example, or no, I think this example comes from our friend Thomas Jude Germanario, who's brilliant on things, but it would just be, you know, that, again, a stark view that this was poetry. The consonants H-T-R-D-B-N-S could be heat red beans, hot red buns, could be like a lot of different things. And whatever you whatever suggests itself to you, because the vowels weren't inserted. The Masoretic text was like, you know, when they talk about the alphabet, you had the winged bird, then you flap it on the ground. Like everything could just be brought down. Yeah. Same thing. That was a different version, like a Russian doll of the Masoretic text. Took this poetry and just swapped it on a page that became kind of an idol, right? So yeah, I had a in, in grad school, I was um there was a rabbi who was teaching me Hebrew I'd go and sit at his house in his porch or his garage and he would smoke cigarettes while he was teaching me yeah you know, all the letters in the Hebrew and what was amazing about this and he would tell you how um if there's two things that have that you need to know about Torah he said for one he says as many souls that were standing at Sinai that day are different ways to read it well, that that because because the fact that your moral consciousness is what guides you into interpretation because in the Septuagint and the original the original languages there's no vowels, just like in, in Egyptian, there's no vowels. So you how where you place the vowels can change the entire story, the entire mm -hmm. story. Entire and, story. And that the Torah is a world builder. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, as, as a narrative technology, as a divine technology, it creates worlds, but it depends on which story you choose. It's kind of like mm -hmm. a choose your yeah. not, not choose your own adventure, but when you look at the fact that the Masoretic text is used in every single Christian Bible in the in the ever, you you have a one a singular interpretation based on where they place the vowel structures. Mm -hmm. um, That's where Margaret Barker is great. Right. And so the, the, when I think about these things, I think about how this, how this even deals with the idea of what Michael said in terms of Proverbs and is talking about this, her, you know, this idea of the divine the feminine or the Shekinah or the, or God's wife or however they wanted to discuss these things. And I know different, you know, um, denominations discuss this in different ways, but it actually reminds me of like, 
Or don't discuss it in different ways. Or don't ways. discuss as the case may be. It reminds me of like Plato's idea of a noble lie. And I think that we tell certain narratives to arrive at certain outcomes in our society. And this is kind of what I wrote about a little bit in, in um, Jesus, the imagination is that the stories that we tell construct our world, even on when things happen that are wars or other types of things that happen out in, in the world, we read it on the news or we hear it happening and we get told this is so. And then we go out in the world and perform it as if it's so that that is a form of magic. That is, that is a form of manifestation because everyone's buying into a story. So mm -hmm. what happens if you change the story? This is kind of what Blake is into, right? What, what you're capable mm -hmm. of perceiving will change the outcome of what's there because you, you are capable of, of, of having a, a, a perception that is beyond just the Guinea sun machine, right. materialistic existence. And they became what they beheld. That's, that's what yes. Blake's doing in Jerusalem, right? Yes. It's and then when when they can't resist, uh, in a way, in Bla in Blake when when the, the the characters can't resist the onslaught of lies, they split right, right. into the emanation right because the emanation tears from the specter tears from right and it's a mess right it's a psychological. But it's also how like truth consolidates right. error for Blake too right yeah. yes which is one of the hopeful things in our time when I get really bleak, you know I just think ah. Oh, Maybe, you know, the people who are speaking truth because evil seems to get the ascendant, but it could just be evil just consolidating in our time and better to have it so simple to see so we can name it like a demon and cast it out as opposed to it was always implicit, you know. And that's that's the mm -hmm. importance of discernment. And it's, the idea also, we we're, we have such a, a linear, small section of time that we experience in our lives, right? Or even if you're know, reading back history, we have 5,000 years worth of information that we have in terms of the quote uh, official historical record. We won't talk about things that don't get talked about, right? But mm -hmm. um, when you look at what we actually can can break down um, in terms of what we can what we can fix, what we can change, it's such a small thing. We don't understand that there is something larger that's happening necessarily. That whether it's the ice age has ended 13,000 years ago, we're on your your time scale, right? or it was the class cataclysm that happened, the world is still adjusting to that change in the same way that I thought, I think Stephen Clark says a lot, like we're still adjusting to, or even Steiner, we're still adjusting to the resurrection and the, inf the effects of how that's unfolding. So maybe, yes, maybe the dark is rising, but it's like, if you have a wound, you've got to get out all the, you know, pus, you've got to get you yeah. to run it out and clean out. And maybe we're still purging. And what would that look like if we look at, you know, I hear all the time that, the church is meant to be not just a, a sanctuary, but it's a hospital, right? So there's this idea that we're supposed to be healed when we go into it. And this is what Blake talks about all the time is that Christ is healing bodies. He's healing the sick. He's making people be able to see the lame. We're supposed to be given a, corporeal, a corporality that actually can be penetrated and useful to spirit. And I, I think that we've, even, even the pagan bros out there go super materialist. And I just don't, there has to be a synthesis. And this is what's actually great about Corban is that he's talking about every single person has their their angel and the the greeks would call sometimes would say we call it a daemon right their higher self their 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 angelic form but that's like that that's your whole soul so what you have you have this you have this bit of the divine walking with you all the time even if you can't experience it but that's like you know we we, we are so much more than we seem to be and i think we forget that all the time and it's hard though because the world looks terrible it's it feels very doom and gloom and i definitely suffer from that on occasion as well i try to hold on to the fact that there's the changes are still happening i just i, I only can see this much of it though mm -hmm. yeah yeah that, that great scene if you know the, the film uh the last temptation of christ yes when My jesus is talking, a portrait of that jesus in is talking to judas i only see i can only, you know, I only get a little bit that's ahead of me that's all i get and you have you have to turn me in Right. Crazy. Let me let me re-engage. Let me let me shift. Um, I thought it was relevant before, but it was another breakfast conversation that made me think that I'd be talking about it later. <laughs> yeah. But the um the uh this is gonna seem like quite a departure, but I think I actually oh. think it can crystallize some things. Um a phenomenon I guess I've seen two I remember distinctly, but I think I've seen more. Uh, I'm gonna say it's a Twitter phenomenon. You see kind of a white girl that we're prone to hate now obsessing on how her she she has to work 40 hours and she takes a subway oh, in yes. and she has no money for life or anything. And uh, what's been fun is to beat up on those people. Right. Just say, oh, my God, this complaining like wench or something. And the first one I saw 
you know, the girl was just perfect, almost like, like a Barbie doll, but I had a lot of sympathy for it, you know, and I just think, you know, we could, and people will say, okay, maybe there's something like we could have done it better. We have, we're producing so much, but we're still artificial scarcity and everything. Yeah. But, um, you know, can we hear it from these? I want to say, can, they're not the ones to be articulating this message that we've built a world that's just so crappy, but I think it's fairly it's not out of keeping with the gospel story to say we might hear it from areas we don't expect it. Like if there's one place the world thinks we're never going to get truth, it'd be a very wealthy, young, blonde girl, right? right. And um, so, but then this person said, and I think it, it kind of ties in. That's why I thought it tied into this conversation well. All these versions of masks we have to put on. I hadn't thought of this, but there was a book written in 1983 that somebody who was commenting on one of these videos of girl complaining said that was, you know, it documented the energy it takes. A farmer can just have a miserable day and he doesn't have to hide it. He has a miserable, so it was easier for him in this, I'm going to bring back Iowa. No. You know, but honestly, it's easy for him to visit the underworld. He's having a shitty day. It's just a shitty day. But all of a sudden, our youth and everybody had to go into, uh, you know, wherever you put on a smile, say, have a nice ma'am. You know, we, we want it your way. And they're saying it's very, very, very exhausting. And we're asking people whether they're working in cubicles um, to put on a certain demeanor, whether they're doing customer service stuff at McDonald's or really anywhere, but to wear these false demeanors. And this was a this was an angle on that phenomenon I hadn't thought too much about. What do you think, Lindsay? And again, because it made me think it's almost like we have to go for authenticity or die. Let's put no more masks, the human face, the persona. This is a big theme in, in the Trappist Monastery work, the real face. Um, let's put all of our eggs in that basket and it will transform society around it you know no i think i think it's i mean i saw that kind of go viral online as well this past couple days <clears throat> and what is amazing is the amount of absolute bitterness in people who see someone who's suffering and goes well she asked for it yeah right and that there, there's that idea of knighthood or the idea of this protective quality of um what the masculine does with the feminine and like i one of my favorite i kind of like little throwaways is like you know if he loves her he'll build her a garden and mm -hmm. by, by that, I mean like a walled garden, like there's a space that the masculine holds, the masculine's a world builder by nature. He goes out and he creates skyscrapers and, and, and laws and society and all kinds of masterful works of art and, and a, a society that can be occupied. And then a, the feminine goes in and makes a home of it, you know? So there, there, there's like, there's, there's, we hear about the words enclosure a lot. And there, mm -hmm. there's a, a positive form of that. And there's a very, very detrimental form of that. I well, think that what, yeah. I think what this woman is, this young girl is, and yes, people can bring this so out say, oh, she should just get, you know, move somewhere cheaper. There's all kinds of solutions mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can be had, but the nature of what she's experienced is like, if this is life, can I punch out? Because mm -hmm. I don't want that. This is not, this is, this does not feed me. And mm -hmm. we're, we're having a, we're starving for meaning we're starving for purpose we're trying for relationship especially since what happened four years ago and we were all kind of were isolated we don't even know how to be in the same room with people anymore let alone a community let alone a city let alone you know 15 minute one so like the, this this quality of authenticity means can you look the problem in the eye and not just go well i had to deal with that so they can deal with it too mm -hmm. how say this, this is how it's always been is not a solution to anything that's you know, a huge theme for me, as well, you've heard, like whether feudalism or something. It's just, no, it's always been this way. I had a shitty job when and, I grew and up. And do you like right. it? And do, are you yeah, happy? Right, and right, and right. did you enjoy having to do that much? You know, people talk about boomers all the time, which drives me crazy. I, I understand. I'm guilty. That, but yeah. You know, I'm in the presence of, you know, so it's like, it's like, I'm on the edge though, too. So I, I have to tread carefully, right? Um, no, I'm not a boomer, but I beat up on them too much. Right. You know, well, I don't, I don't even get that whole thing. I, don't even, I can't even tell. It, when, there's a lot of, there's a lot of resentment that the world is the way it's because boomers were essentially financially selfish. This, this is, this is, I think the bottom of the trope basically. You know, it's crazy. But you also have in, in the boomer population outside of the, the trust fund babies that were, you know, went from being hippies into yuppies, right? That whole pipeline is you have people who were very competent and learned actual skill sets to actually use in their lives. We have people who are plumbers and carpenters and actually know how to do skilled manual labor that have no replacement in the next 20 years because no one, everyone wants to have an email job or be an influencer, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you want, for young girls or even people who are farmers, as Mike is saying, Toil is kind of part of the human condition and we have to work hard sometimes, but in, for what purpose are we doing it? It's going to make 
all the difference. If we're doing it for some McDonald's or for some corporate sellout hack shell company, you're going to find the experience of how we do that, how we experience that very differently. If, if you were in love with what you do, it doesn't feel like work ever. And we know that it's called passion and we're, mm -hmm. we're very, very dry on that right now. Really? Oh, yeah. Yes, and really, really dry on right. skills too, right? No, because exactly. I mean, yeah. Or dry on what, Michael? School. Dry on what? <laughs> Skills. Skills. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I look at school. Like my my daughter currently is in a public school. It, it'll change next year, but that was a <clears throat> a feasible thing I had to do. And I look at the competency of teachers that exist in public schools. I'm just like, you're it's training a them for a world that probably isn't even going to exist in 18 years. Like, what are you doing? There, there, there's no there's no humanity in it. It's it's just it's you know, Sir, Sir Kent Robertson talked about you know the the, the what do you call it, the industrial line of education, and we're so there. I, I just the biggest issue I think happening in the next probably five or 20 years is that if people can rescue their humanity or not, and that's going to be the biggest, the biggest wow. pivot yeah. of yeah. whether or not we submit to trans, you know, technocracy or transhumanism as, as just, it follows in so much this idea of escapism, like, please just don't make it hurt anymore. Mm -hmm. Give me a way out. And people do that in all kinds of ways. They numb themselves with religion, with drugs, with alcohol, and maybe a computer and maybe an upboot of consciousness to nowhere, you know, to no man's land. They might, you know, I, I can see the archons, as Michael and I talk about, being willing to make the earth so painfully inhabitable that it almost seems like a godsend and a mercy to go jump into a silicon body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Crazy. Lindsay. Crazy good, crazy awesome. <laughs> this is what's like in my yeah, mind like, all day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so what yeah, we got to do is have Lindsay yeah. back on with like Steven sometime. That would be fun. I would. I would just sit and listen. I go, well, tell me more about all these. No, things. no, 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 no. You you guys would cross fertilize <laughs> so well. But again, that was that was really great, Lindsay. And again, it's your fan favorite for a reason because when you uh, when you get going, there's a few things like it, and uh, we learned so much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, friends, we're kind of winding up the regeneration podcast. Michael, what's uh, what do you need people to hear? And Lindsay, you know, right. look at Lindsay's article. Go buy the two of the three will profit from this by name, um, and you will profit too if you read Lindsay's article in the most recent Jesus the Imagination. Uh, what's the title of your article again, Lindsay? Uh, storytelling in the Age of the Machine. Yeah, it's really great. So much in there. And Michael, what's new with you? Well, after I get off of here, I'm going outside to. Hang up syrup buckets. Okay. When does your poetry Yay. book get? Oh, I'll do mine today too. Good call. When do you? Uh, when does your? Um, because we're gonna have a warm week here. I think gets up to fifty. And cold at night. That's the, and yeah. sunny. That's when you yeah. want to do it. I'm so glad you reminded me. I can do it today. Uh, so the um, Michael, when does your book of poetry come out? Next month, it looks like. Okay, I knew it was no, I, my, I was surprised because I, my publisher moved it to the head of the line, and. Uh -huh. uh, it's going to have some really stellar artwork on the cover. Yeah. I'm glad one, you came up with this one theme because I'm so interested. <laughs> but your book, you know, you're saying it's Oh, it's not like Lindsay Rose did the cover, but. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, so it'll be out next month. He won. He wants all the stuff by the end of the month. So it usually it just takes a couple of weeks after that. Yeah. And uh, the theme that we're still kind of novices learning to walk on this hunk of granite. Is a biggie in your uh, in your book and poetry. I look forward to it. Well, it's not that it's that it's that I just think it's unexplored territory. Yeah, there are many stories still here. Yeah, we just yeah. we just been American literature has been mostly exploring at the surface. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Michael, I'll right. send you a link to this essay by Powies on his farewell to America. It's mm -hmm. really good on this. It's really, really good on this. Yes. Well, Lindsay sing me too, me too. Absolutely will. So thank you both, Lindsay. You're going to come on again, fan favorite, and. Um, uh, everybody have a great weekend. Thank you for listening to the Regeneration Podcast. We'll see you again.